We look forward to hearing from our historian, Barbara Sokoloff, who is doing interviews, essentially modern testimonials of se several of our members. I'm so pleased to introduce our speakers. We have been anticipating this talk for more than a year. Rosemary Beebe is professor of Spanish literature at Santa Clara University. Robert Senkowicz is professor of history at the same university. He, he is the author together with Rosemary of a number of books dealing with California in its Spanish and Mexican eras, including recently to toil in that vineyard of the Lord, contemporary scholarship on Junipro Serra. I have not read that one, but I can recommend Junipro Serra, California Indians and the Transformation of a Missionary. Also testimonials, which I adored, early California through the eyes of women, and lands of promise and despair, a sampling of original sources describing the history of California through several centuries. We look forward to many more books, but right now I'm gonna turn things over to our speakers. Excellent, thank you, Lucia. Thank you for inviting us to come and speak to you again. It would sure be a lot more fun if we were all together at the Presidio uh, like we have been in the past. And we've always had a great time with all of you because you've been so supportive of, of our work and so interested in what we're doing. Uh, today, we're going to be talking to you about three uh, military men, Hutton, Sully, and Myers. You'll see some of their artistic renderings on the screen, and you'll have the aha moment like, oh, I've seen that before. Uh, but we're going to do a deeper dive, as they say, into their lives, and we're going to introduce you to them in a very different way. Uh, we hope that you enjoy the presentation. We're planning on turning this project into a future book, so any comments by you at the end are greatly appreciated. So thank you very much for inviting us. Yes, and I'd like to uh, also uh, second Rosemary in thanking you all for, for for joining us uh, in this way or allowing us to join you in this way. We both remember what a great time we had uh, a few years ago when we talked about Oops. testimonials um, in, the, um, in the, um, the golf club at the Presidio. Mm -hmm. And we hope to be able to join you at some point in the future talking about um, um, early California of which the Presidio was such an incredibly important part. Well, as Rosemary said, we're going to be talking about three people, okay? And the first person we're going to be talking to about is William Myers. And here's a self-portrait of him. We really don't know. There's no, there's no actual portrait of him. And this is sort of a caricature self-portrait that, that Myers did. Myers was born in Philadelphia around, um, uh, on February 13, 1815. We don't know very much about his youth, but it's likely that he, that he joined, that he was in the Merchant Marines before 1841, because he does allude to having visited Rio de Janeiro on the ship, the Carolinian, which was a Merchant Marine ship. He began his career in the Navy uh, as an enlisted man. He worked as a civilian at the Washington Naval Yard, and then he was appointed to the rank of gunner. And on November 1st, 1841, he began a three-year cruise to the Pacific aboard the Cyan, which you can see uh, in, in front of you. So he spent the time with, on the with Pacific Squadron uh, of, um, headed by uh, Thomas Catsby Jones. Um, and Myers was an amateur artist. And what he did when he was on, this, on, the, on the Cyan and on the Pacific Squadron is he compiled a detailed journal which contained over 100 full page watercolors of the places and the peoples that he saw on the voyage. Now, Meyer's participation in Commodore Jones's ill-advised seizure of Monterey on October 20th, 1842, resulted in an eyewitness painting of the landing. And I'm sure this was probably an aha moment for many of you looking at this, this rendering. It's, it's very, very famous. One thing that Myers also did, aside from uh, producing watercolors and other paintings, is he also kept a journal. So we have uh, detailed entries about different events of importance to him and to history. The journal entry on October 19th is the following. Stiff breezes, 
land in sight, filling grape and musket balls for nine pounder. We are now approaching Monterey in the territory of Mexico, the enemy of our country, whose flag it is our duty to strike and hoist our own in its place, together with a few spangled banners, eagles, glory, and soldiers. So it appears we are going to have a fight. Bueno. So he's already starting to practice his Spanish with his bueno. Now, the Cyan was at anchor in Monterey Bay for considerable periods of time in November 1842 and again in the spring of 1843. Myers has numerous journal entries in which he writes about hunting wildfowl on the surface of a lagoon near Monterey. And there you have it. When it says there at the bottom of the screen that the Laguna del Rey is just east of the grounds of the old Del Monte Hotel. And I think many of you are familiar with that. Okay. Well, Jones um, took Monterey in 1842, um, as you probably know, because he was commander of the Pacific Squadron and he had standing orders that if war was going to break out between the US and Mexico, what he should do is head to California and take possession of Monterey, which was the capital, and take possession of California. So when war actually did break out in 1846, uh, the first phase of that war was very much of a naval phase. And here's a, a picture that, um, that Hutton, excuse me, that Myers uh, drew in 1847 with the uh, American ships anchored in, in Monterey Bay. And you can see the, the Congress in Lexington. A lot of them are not familiar to you, but the Portsmouth, which we'll uh, deal with in a, in a few minutes, probably is, uh, is, is familiar uh, to you. The first phase of the war was a naval phase. Um, uh, the the uh, slow took Monterey, the Portsmouth took Yerba Buena, which evolved into San Francisco. Los Angeles was taken as well. And, and there were some troops that were left down uh, in Los Angeles. And by the midsummer, it looked like the war in California was pretty much over with the US securely in command. Here we have an image by Myers of a California Lancer. And I want to have you focus on the colorful nature of the uniform. You see the green jacket, the blue pants, the, the saddle blanket, very ornately embroidered, the saddle. And in contrast to the American uniforms, the California uniforms just really stood out. You'll see that in, in a few of the images we're going to show you. Here we have the retreat of the Americans at San Pedro under Captain Mervyn, October 7th, 1846. Stockton left less than 40 men in Los Angeles under the command of Archibald Gillespie. Now, Gillespie's rule was really heavy handed and the Californios rebelled. On September 29th, the Californios forced the small American garrison to retire to the harbor. And soon after, 200 reinforcements sent by Stockton under the command of Captain William Mervang arrived, but they were forced to retreat on October 8th in a battle that lasted one hour. Not bad. And here we have another image, which you probably have seen, the fight at San Pascual. Now on December 6th, after a long march from Santa Fe, Stephen Watts Kearney and his men arrived in California. The Americans were pretty confident that they would easily vanquish the Californios, but they did not succeed. After the battle on December 6th, which lasted only 30 minutes, 21 American soldiers were killed. And this was the largest number of American casualties in California during the war. So after the Battle of San Pasqual, what happened was that um, uh, Stockton and Kearney reorganized their troops in San Diego, which at that time was the center of, of kind of pro-American settled uh, sentiment. And what they did was they marched north from San Diego uh, at the beginning of January. On January the 8th, what they do, and you can see in the picture, they cross the San Gabriel River and they repulse the Californios who were on the other side of the river and under the command of uh, Jose Maria Flores. Um, there's the, the picture of, um, of uh, them crossing the river, and there's a picture of them repulsing General Flores' attack 
upon the left wing of, Scott, of, uh, of Stockton's army on January 8th. Um, on the next day, after they had camped uh, near the river on the January the 8th, on the next day, there was another battle at, uh, at La Mesa on the plain between the San Gabriel River and the Los Angeles River. Uh, near the, for those of you who, uh, who are aware of the geography, it's near the present uh, town of Vernon down in Southern California. The Americans beat back, as you can see in the picture, they beat back um, Flores's charge and they won the Battle of, of La Mesa, the last significant battle in California during the Mexican War. A couple of days later, on January 12th, the last significant California force uh, surrendered to Fremont and the Treaty of Coengo was signed on January the 13th. And that treaty basically ended uh, the war, the Mexican War in California. Now, there's a connection between Franklin Delano Roosevelt and these images that you may not be aware of. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt was famous for having been a collector of stamps, but he also collected a vast amount of material relating to the Navy. Uh, the collection of Myers artwork is housed at the Roosevelt Library in Hyde Park, New York. And I'd like to share with you Roosevelt's comments about this artwork. He said, in many years of collecting sketches, paintings and engravings relating to the Navy of the United States, I had found virtually none which had connection with naval operations in the Pacific in 1846 and 1847. When I had the opportunity a few years ago of acquiring the original sketchbook of Gunner William H. Myers, I realized its historical value. Not only do these sketches fill a definite gap in the history of this nation and of our sister Republic of Mexico, but they also throw an interesting light on the conduct of land and naval warfare less than 100 years ago. So if you'd like to see the originals, you can go to Hyde Park and they have them there for you to, to enjoy. Now, Myers resigned from the Navy in June of 1848. After his return to Philadelphia, he had second thoughts and he attempted to get reinstated, but his health was so impaired that his requests were turned down. On October 19th, 1850, his wife wrote a letter to the Secretary of the Navy saying that her husband was physically unable to do further naval service. And Meyer's fate is unknown to us. We don't know what happened to him after that. And interestingly enough, one of the reasons that FDR was so interested in these in the Meyer's drawings is he himself had been uh, Assistant Secretary of the Navy uh, during World War I. Uh, it was actually a job that he really wanted because it had previously been held by a person whom he called Cousin Theodore, who of course was Teddy Roosevelt. And Hyde Park, of course, is on the Hudson River and Roosevelt had done a lot of sailing on, on the river, but he really liked, liked these pictures because as a former assistant secretary of the Navy, he was continually interested in his life on filling out uh, the history of the American Navy. Well, the second person we're going to talk about is William Rich Hutton. And there's a picture of him as a young man. He was born uh, in 1826 in Washington, D.C. Uh, his parents were James Hutton and Salome Rich, Salome Rich Hutton. And his, his dad was a clerk in the Navy Department. So there's a Navy connection here as well. But what happened was that his dad, James, died. And Salome's brother, who was named William Rich, moved in with the family in 1843. And William Rich, the uncle, was appointed a paymaster for the army. And in the Mexican War, they were assigned to go out to California. And, and, and William was supposed to be a, a paymaster for the troops out there. And he took along William Rich Hutton uh, as his assistant. And so they left DC on January, in January of 1847. And they, they go through Panama, as, as many people did. And at Panama, and this is before the gold rush, so there wasn't a lot of regular transportation at Panama, they missed the ship that was heading north. And so what they do is they took the next ship, which was heading south, 
down to Peru. And in Peru, in Callao, they were able to pick up another ship that was going north. And they finally arrived uh, in California in April of uh, uh, 1847. Here is an image that you all will recognize. It's the Matanza. William Rich Hutton was really intrigued by everything that he saw around him. He was intrigued by the landscape, by the people, by the daily life. And he recorded much of this, not only in his letters to his family and in a journal, but also in a pictorial form. So this watercolor drawing is of the aftermath of the slaughter of cattle. You'll notice, and I'm sorry, some of you are probably still eating your lunch, but you notice there are four freshly beheaded cattle heads in the foreground. There's a cart there in the center, a carreta, and then a male figure who seems to be walking away from the area. In the distance, you will see that there are rows of cattle hides that are hanging out to dry. And then here on the left, Hutton has depicted two Native American women. So this is, uh, an image that is filled with different types of people, uh, different activities. And here we have trying out tallow, another image that is widely recognized. Uh, many of the workers uh, you will see in Hutton's drawings, many of the workers who are working with the tallow or involved with the slaughter of cattle are Native Americans. And you can tell by the features how Hutton has drawn them, they're Native Americans. So Hutton arrived in San Francisco, or actually it was called Yerba Buena at the time, uh, on April 19th, 1847. Um, and, and basically what happens is that he gets there in, the, in right before a huge transition of this area. Yerba Buena was a small Mexican village. And you can see here that there, it, was, it was kind of on the inlet of a cove. Um, and on the, on the left, that, that, that point is Rincon Point. And on the right, that point is Clark's Point. And Yerba Buena was kind of uh, nestled within that, uh, within that cove. Well, what happens is that on July 9th, 1846, the American flag was raised near the Mexican Customs House in the plaza, which is a block up from the, um, from the shore. Um, by the U.S. by uh, Captain John Montgomery, who was captain of the USS Portsmouth, and since um, since uh, Montgomery and the Portsmouth did it, the area of the beach was named Montgomery, and eventually it evolved into what we now know in San Francisco as Montgomery Street, and the old Mexican Plaza was renamed the Portsmouth. Now, San Francisco uh, renamed Portsmouth Square, which is now in uh, in Chinatown. If those of you who've been to San Francisco know. What happens is that um, there's an explosive growth of Yerba Buena during this, uh, during this time. Uh, in 1846, when this picture was probably drawn, there were about 200 people living there. By 1852, according to the state census, there were 36,000 people uh, living there. Uh, what happens is that Hutton stays in the city hotel which as you can see from the arrow is close to the Mexican um, uh, plaza. And um, that's where he's, he, you know, his, his uncle kind of does his job as paymaster, shuttling back and forth between uh, Yerba Buena, which evolved into San Francisco and then, uh, and then Monterey. Um, the next slide shows um, a view from the, from the um, Portsmouth Square itself. Now this is, this is in 1851, so just at the, kind of the beginning of the, uh, of the gold rush. And you can see the way in which the old Mexican plaza, and the customs house is still there, even though it's not on that, uh, that picture. Um, what happens is that as San Francisco, it becomes the commercial center of the gold rush. And, and Hutton kind of uh, appreciates the fact that the gold rush instituted a very, very, uh, um, wild roller coaster economic ride in, uh, in California. So in 1849, he says, and this is at the height of the gold rush where people are arriving constantly, I hear that the prices of good in San Francisco are still high, more so even than we, when we were here last spring. 
the prices are high because there are more people and they're demanding food and they're demanding, you know, the things to go out and, and, uh, and pan for gold. But a year later, Hutton writes, the immense business of San Francisco with its extravagant rates is rapidly breaking up. Many firms have failed. Where a room could not be hired for 50 or $80 a month, now numbers of houses are for rent. Real estate is worth only 35 to 40% of what it was in the spring, and the greater fall is anticipated. So, this roller coaster up and down really uh, defined the, the, uh, the economy of San Francisco during the gold rush. One merchant called it the inflation of an overdone business. There are just too many people trying to make a killing in the business uh, community. So San Francisco, where, where he was, you can see on the, on, the, uh, on the map on the right, what happens to Yerba Buena. The cove is basically filled in from Rincon Point on the south to Clark's Point on the, uh, on the north. And, the, and the, 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 the cove is filled in with all sorts of things. You know, it was not unusual when, when ships would come in for the crew to desert and run to the gold fields and the ship would be just a, rot, a rotting hulk there. You know, it's, it's kind of, you know, even now when we go out to, you know, when, when you go out to San Francisco, basically everything from Montgomery Street out is landfill because it, it was originally uh, a cove. Hutton drew a number of really interesting shots of this transition. So here's one that he did in 1847 before the gold rush. And you can see that Yerba Buena is, is there. The cove is there. There are a few ships there, but, but, uh, but not all that much. Uh, around the same time, he did uh, a drawing from Rincon uh, Point, and you can see that he does the, he does a sketch, and then he finishes it off later with a, a watercolor. And you can see that uh, you know he's he's looking out across the bay. He's he's at Rincon Point, and he's looking out across the cove uh, to Clark's Point, and you can see the houses that are nestled there in the in the Arba Buena. And you can see two rock piles in the foreground and a bird um, floating in between. By the time we get to 1851, uh, San Francisco has become a tremendous, you know, San Francisco was calling itself the Emporium of the Pacific and, and for good reason. The bay uh, accommodated ships from the east constantly and it was, uh, it was a tremendously um, a vibrant kind of commercial city with these kind of ups and downs that we that we talked about. On the top, you can see the the bay looking north from Telegraph Hill, and on the uh, in the bottom, you can see the entrance to the bay, um, the Golden Gate itself from from Telegraph Hill. And that view was very very important because Telegraph Hill got its name because that's where lookouts were stationed to signal the arrival of ships and ships would bring people and ships would bring supplies and, and most importantly to the people who were living there, ships would bring mail. And that was terribly, terribly important. Now Hutton had the opportunity to go from San Francisco to Monterey and back because of his uncle's work as paymaster. Hutton was very much taken as was Myers with uh, images from the landscape in the Monterey area. And he created many spe pencil sketches of the vegetation of the area. These are just a few. There are many more in the collection, but they're absolutely beautiful. You look at the pine cones, they're, they're just so incredibly realistic. He also was taken by the different buildings in the Monterey area. So here we have the customs house. You see this right here. You've all been there, I'm sure, many times. And he has captions that he hand wrote here. At, he, this is the mountain, El Gavilan or El Toro customs house. And then there's this word mole, M-O-L-E. And I thought, mole, what are you, what is this? Well, that's the way he heard the word muelle, which means wharf in Spanish. So that's the, that is what he, heard in his head, but the actual word is muelle. So you have the customs house and, and the wharf. Here we have Monterey from the old fort. Again, a pencil drawing depicting various structures 
including tent posts you have here next to a corral. Uh, you have hills in the background and the bay in the foreground on the left. So Customs House, here's the church, which was the Royal Presidio Chapel, a new butcher shop. And I like this, here's Larkin's Wharf with the hoist. You can see it right here. And I found this to be very intriguing that here's the chute for carrying drinking water to the ships. He does also point out this home, Garner's home. Now this is the home of William Garner, who was an Englishman who jumped ship in Santa Barbara in 1824, and he moved to the Monterey area. He lived in California for the next 25 years. Okay. Here we have Main Street. I think, Bob, that's yours. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, I just had to unmute myself. Uh, oh. Main Street in Monterey. Now, if you, if you go to that downtown Monterey now, uh, the, the, the Main Street is Alvarado Street. But one street over is a street which is named Calle Principal, which does mean Principal Street or Main Street. And it, thought it was in 1847 when, um, when Hutton was there, the actual main street. And he, he talks about a couple of things. There's the Astor House. Um, next to it, there's the home of Don Manuel Jimeno, who was the governmental secretary, and his wife, Angustias de la Guerra. And the third house there is the house of Captain uh, Walton. Now, the, the Astor House was, was, is an interesting kind of, it was sort of a gathering place. Um, and Walter Colton, who was an American minister who was the Alcalde of Monterey for a while, um, in his diary uh, says, uh, this is on May 12th, 1847. So about the time that Hutton did this, a nest of gamblers, Colton writes, a nest of gamblers arrived in town yesterday and last evening opened a monte, a, a gambling, a card house at the hotel honored with the name of the Astor House. So the, the, the Astor House there was kind of a saloon, a gambling spot. And the Walton House, uh, Captain Walton, uh, he was Leonidas, Leonidas Walton, who was a naval officer from, uh, uh, from Georgia. Now, another uh, a view of Monterey in 1849 shows all the way over in the, uh, in the right, uh, excuse me, on the left, the Presidio Chapel again. And then there's General Riley's house, General Riley, Bennett Riley, was the military governor in 1849, who in fact called the California Constitutional Convention. And then the rest of the, we've already seen, Captain Walton's house and the, uh, and the Astor house. So Monterey in 1849 was, you know, beginning. And here you can see it from the, from the watercolor that, um, that Hutton did. It's beginning to kind of, you know, it is the capital still. It, by this time, it's, it's, its preeminence is being threatened, and, and by the end of the year, its preeminence was, was pretty much finished by, uh, by San Francisco. But it, you can see that it's, it's, you know, it's beginning to, uh, to resemble the Monterey that we, um, that we know. Hutton also drew uh, near the Presidio Chapel what he calls the Rancheria de las Lavanderas, the, the place of the people doing the wash. And this is basically, if you've been to Monterey and you go, you know, you, you, went, you enter through Moonras uh, Street and then you go off to the right towards the Presidio Chapel and there's the estuary. And that's basically um, uh, where that was. And Hutton also drew uh, the fort, uh, the Monterey Redoubt. Um, this, was, this was basically the Americans version replacing what by that time was a fairly, um, unused Monterey uh, Presidio. And finally, the, uh, he drew uh, the Royal Presidio Chapel, which as you know, is still there and has been uh, restored on Church Street um, in Monterey. Well, then Hutton goes to Carmel and he is fascinated by the mission. Here we have two views of the Carmel mission, a view into the courtyard here and you have this crumbling wall in the foreground. So this right now, <clears throat> this area, if you were to go to the mission, there's a fountain here, and then there's a school over to, to the right here. So I hope that can orient you a, a bit. Here is another view of Mission San Carlos Borromeo. This area right here is where there is a cemetery. So here's the entrance 
to the mission over here would be the bookstore and over here would be the museum that's there today. Hutton then goes uh, to Los Angeles. He also goes to Los Angeles and he drew, uh, you know, then as now, uh, San Pedro, or as it's now called San Pedro, was, it, was, the, was the port of Los Angeles, all right? Uh, now, Southern California, basically from about San Luis Obispo down, remained uh, during the early days of the American uh, possession, it remained much more Hispanic and Latino than from San Luis Obispo North. The, the gold rush was something that was focused very much, as you know, in, in, in Northern California. But the Mexican orientation of the South um, was, uh, was still very, very strong. Um, and, and there were kind of, you know, the, the Americans who were down there were, were quite aware of this. For example, in August of 1849, Hutton wrote, we have just heard a report that the Sonorans, the, the people who lived in the Mexican state of Sonora, which borders on what's now Arizona, in re the, the Sonorans in revenge for being turned out of the mines are coming to this place to kill all the Americans here and that Urea will head them. So there were, there, were, there were rumors going on, they were unfounded, but there were rumors that the Hispanic presence in Southern California was so strong that Mexicans were going to come up and, and reinforce it. Um, I did also some other drawings of, uh, of Los Angeles. Uh, you can see there in the top, you can see the, the, the chapel, the, the church in the, in the main part of the street. And that was done from, from Fort Hill. And the second uh, one, the one on the bottom, you can see that uh, from, another, from another view, you can see the vineyards, you know, and it might surprise us, but during the Mexican era, Los Angeles was actually a very, very significant wine growing uh, area. It was kind of the Sonoma and the Napa of, uh, of Mexican California. The next slide shows um, Fort Moore which was the American fort that was built at Los Angeles. It was named after Benjamin Moore, who was not the painting person. But Benjamin, <laughs> Moore, Benjamin Moore was an American officer who had been killed at the Battle of San Pasqual that we talked about uh, a, a little bit uh, early. And when he was down in Los Angeles, um, Hutton became um, associated with this fellow whom he had met in, in Monterey. And this is Edwin excuse me, Edward Otto Cresap Ord. Uh, he had been stationed, Ord had been, he's an army officer who had been stationed uh, along with a couple of other army officers. One was named Henry Halleck, who became, became chief of staff during the, uh, during the Civil War. Uh, and another was a lieutenant named William Tecumseh Sherman, who was also stationed in, uh, in Monterey. And then in the mid 1850s, returned to San Francisco to run his father in Law's Bank. But Ord was, um, um, was stationed there and, um, you know, and he's, a, he's a West Point graduate. And a lot of these West Point graduates, one of the things that they studied in, at West Point was topography and sketching and drawing. Because, you know, one of the things that was expected that army officers were going to do was be explorers, you know? And, and so a lot of these guys came out with uh, the ability to do, to, topographical landscape and surveying kinds of things. And so what happened, this, this by the way, Ord became uh, a well-known general during the Civil War. He was actually at Appomattox when Lee surrendered. And a lot of the Union soldiers who were there tried to take souvenirs uh, of the event. And, this, and Ord took this particular table in front of him as a souvenir. And this is the table on which Robert E. Lee had had signed the surrender document. Now, so Ward kind of took this, this picture was taken when he was military commander of Richmond right after the Civil War. And eventually the Smithsonian got this table, this table back. But what happens is that Ord does the first survey of Los Angeles. Um, and he does it in 1849, I believe. And you can see there, there's Ord signing it and Hutton is his assistant. And so the first, the first survey, the American survey of Los Angeles, the first survey that's done is done by Ord and by, and by Hutton. And you can and see so, the date there, August 29th, 1849, right under right. the signatures. Exactly right. So 
This is what Ciudad de Los Angeles, the city of the angels, uh, was meant to look like in, uh, in 1849. And the last slide that we have here are two views that Hutton did of Los Angeles. Again, a kind of a sketch view on the top and the more finished view on the, uh, on the bottom. And you can see the, um, the way in which he's, you know, he, he, what, what really gets him, what really uh, appeals to him, which of course, you know, he's never seen before are these mountains. They are just so, so huge. Hutton has the opportunity to travel to Santa Barbara. And again, he puts his artistic skills to good use. Here we have Santa Barbara from the Anchorage, June 30th, 1847. Here we have the mission in the background, a little vessel here in the bay. And Santa Barbara is beginning to grow. Here we have the pencil sketch and the watercolor rendering of, of the mission. And it's again, as Bob mentioned, the mountains in the background are always quite prominent in Hutton's artwork. And here, Mission Santa Barbara from the hill. And he writes here, with Santa Cruz Island visible in the distance 25 miles away. So looking out to sea. This area here is where the cemetery is today. Uh, you have people like uh, the De La Guerra family buried here. And so this is a side view of the mission. And here we have the waterworks and Hutton eventually becomes an engineer. So he is very fascinated by things like waterworks. Hutton had a career after his time in the service, he had a career back East. During the civil war, he worked on the Washington aqueduct in the 1870s and 1880s, he was busy with several engineering projects in Washington, D.C. and the surrounding area. In 1886, he became the consulting engineer for the new Croton Aqueduct. And I love their motto, to quench the thirst of New Yorkers. I think that's absolutely great. And then here we uh, have the Washington Bridge. Hutton relocated to New York in 1880 to work as chief engineer for the Washington Bridge project in 1888 and 1889. And here we have a contemporary photo of, of the bridge. He also was the chief engineer for the Hudson River Tunnel project from 1889 to 1891. And the tunnel was completed in 1908 and opened in 1910. And here we have Hutton as a young man, and here we have him as the seasoned engineer. Okay, and now on to our third and final artist, the Alfred third, Sully. The third person that we're going to be talking about is, is Alfred Sully. He was the, fa the father of a very famous American portrait painter named, named Thomas Sully. Now you probably have never heard, you know, unless you're an art historian, you probably never heard of Thomas Sully, but you do know Thomas Sully. You've been exposed to Thomas Sully. How so? Well, this, if I can get this up there. Yes, there we go. The Here picture go. of Andrew Jackson on the $20 bill is based upon a portrait of Jackson that was done by Thomas Sully in 1845. So you're carrying Thomas Sully around with you without knowing it uh, all the time. Well, Alfred Sully was, uh, he's, he's, um, he was a young lieutenant during the Mexican War, another West Point graduate, and he actually fought during the, uh, during the Mexican War. And this is a portrait of him um, that was featured in a, in a 1914 article uh, in the New York Times, along with some of the drawings that Sully had made when he was serving in the uh, in the Mexican War, now he was a self a self taught artist. You know, his dad was an artist, so he wanted to be an artist too. But as opposed to his dad, who, who generally did uh, portraits, Sully, from his youth, was very much more interested in doing landscapes. And you can see in those Mexican War pictures that the landscapes are are, are very very uh, important. He graduated from West Point in eighteen forty one. Now, after the, after the Mexican War, he is assigned to garrison duty in California. He arrives in Monterey in 1849, 
and he's assigned as a quartermaster. And here's a, here's a picture that he does of Monterey in 49, uh, as he said, taken from the church, from the Presidio uh, Chapel. He lived for the next four years, basically in Monterey. Um, during this time, he took frequent visits to uh, Santa Barbara, but especially to Benicia, which was becoming a, military, a naval base, and also to San Francisco. During his years in, as an officer in California, he witnessed the gold rush and the massive influx of uh, African, uh, excuse me, of Anglo uh, Americans. Now, soon after landing in Monterey, Sully met Angustias de la Guerra, whose Spanish born father, Jose de la Guerra y Noriega, had been commander at the Santa Barbara Presidio. Angustias' husband, Manuel Jimeno Casarín, whom she married in 1833 when she was 18 years old, was a member of the governor's staff in Monterey before the American forces occupied the town in 1846. Now, Angustias had long and close ties to Anglos. Among her in-laws were the American merchant, Alfred Robinson, and the English trader, William Edward Petty Hartnell. Both men became Catholics and Mexican citizens before marrying into her family. Angustias was friendly with many American officers and she saw no reason to behave otherwise, even though she feared that the new regime would bring some difficult changes to her country. Angustias and Manuel Jimeno had, well, they had a strained marriage and they were at odds over financial matters and family matters. They would eventually separate before Manuel died in 1853. On October 31st, Halloween, 1856, in San Francisco, Angustias married this man, Dr. James Ord, an army physician and the brother of Lieutenant Edward Ord, the man who took the table for his own personal souvenir. Here we have the city of Monterey in 1842, showing the Jimeno house right here. And then you have the Larkin house and then the Stokes Adobe, which I don't know if it's still a, a restaurant, but a number of years ago, we, we went there and we ate there and it was exceptionally good and a well-preserved Adobe. Here we have the Casa Jimeno and that was the home of Manuel and Angustias and as it says on the slide, it is a site now of the Marriott Hotel. You may have stayed there, one block up, one block up from Alvarado Street. Now, Angustias uh, was a very gracious hostess. Uh, officers such as Sully found her to be a very kind woman who looked after them, she cared about them. He wrote in a letter to his sister Blanche that a number of the officers boarded at Angustias' home at various times. And uh, Sully described her as a tall, majestic looking woman, about 30 or 35, remarkably handsome, very agreeable, very good natured and very smart. In fact, she is a well-read woman and she would grace any circle of society. High praise from Sully. Here we have a painting that Sully did on the bottom here uh, of a street in Monterey featuring the barracks, El Cuartel, right here uh, on the right. And here we have the entire view of El Cuartel. Now, Sully wrote to Blanche, his sister, and said that Angustias' husband was away temporarily. And since there was no male in the house, she would uh, encourage the male officers to board there. And he said, mi madre, that's the name she calls herself, though she is rather young and handsome to have so old a boy as me, requested that I make her house my home. Well, it was there at that home that Sully met Angustias' elder daughter, Manuela, who was 15 at the time. He describes Manuela as remarkably pretty and gay. She dances and sings and plays the guitar. And like all Spanish girls, she is monstrous fond of flirtation. I fear she finds this rather a hard job with me for my bad Spanish sets her a laughing. However, 
that don't prevent me from having a very agreeable time of it, for she has a good figure, a good foot and ankle, small hands, brilliant black eyes, white teeth, red cheeks, and she is as lively as a cricket. He was in love. Sully sent a daguerreotype of Manuela to his father, who painted this miniature that's on the screen. But Sully complained about it, and he said that his father had not captured her smile. He said, she is not quite smiling enough. Sully fell in love with Manuela and wanted to marry her. She had many suitors, and he was afraid he was going to lose her. He also feared that her parents would object to the marriage because, as he wrote, I have nothing to offer except my good family background and reputation. When he asked Angustias and Jimeno for permission to discuss marriage with Manuela, they actually agreed, thinking that Manuela was only flirting with him and that she would say no, that she'd refuse his proposal. Also, they had plans to marry her to a wealthy relative. Uh, much to their surprise, Manuela accepted the marriage proposal and uh, her parents and many Mexicans in the town strongly objected to the marriage, not because they didn't like Sully, because they did like him, but he was not a Catholic. Uh, Sully told his sister Blanche in another letter, the whole of Monterey has turned against me and they've used all arguments and invented all kinds of lies to assist the parents and oppose our union. This had no other effect on the girl than to make her more firm in wanting to marry me. Well, Sully had no intention of converting to Catholicism. So he had a friend ride to San Francisco to obtain a permission from Bishop Gonzalez Rubio for a Catholic to marry a non-Catholic. In the meantime, Sully was making arrangements so that he and Manuela could get married in Monterey at the home of Captain Elias Kane. And this would happen as soon as his friend returned from San Francisco. So now I'm gonna give you the choreography of the wedding ceremony. You can just imagine this in your mind. It's perfect for a telenovela, I swear. Well, first, Sully arranged for Manuela to be invited to the Kane home on Monday, May 20th. Angustias agreed to let her daughter go to the home as long as she was accompanied by a chaperone. And this chaperone happened to be a young man who admired Manuela very much. On that day, Sully hid in some bushes outside of the house and he hid with the priest who had agreed to perform the marriage because he had the permission in his hand that the, the bishop had sent this dis dispensation. Then Sully also had arranged for a, another friend of his to drop in by accident and distract Manuela's chaperone. So get this guy out of the house. Then Manuela was escorted into the kitchen. Then someone in the house waved a white flag and that was the signal for Sully and the priest to come in to, so that the priest could perform the wedding ceremony. That ceremony lasted five minutes. Sully and Manuela were married there in the kitchen of Elias Kane's home. Well, how do you think her parents felt? Sully wrote that Manuela's parents were, quote, as mad as hell at him. When he went to see them, they told him to never show his face in their home again. Angustias and Manuel were extremely angry with, with their daughter and they kept all of her belongings, including all of her clothing. Now the army wives in town took a great interest in Sully and Manuela and I think they really liked the love story, the sort of elopement. The women helped Manuela by seeing that she was always well-dressed. The officers even held a ball for Manuela and Sully to celebrate their marriage. Sully wrote to his sister, Mrs. Willie and Mrs. Kane went to work and dressed Manuela. They felt the same pride that I did in wanting to make her appear well, and they quite succeeded. Her dress cost $100, and that was before it was even made up. Everybody said she looked beautiful. Of course, I thought so too. Now, coincidentally, William Rich Hutton was stationed in Monterey at the time of the wedding, 
And he wrote in a letter to his mother on September 30th, 1850, Manuelita's marriage has caused a great deal of ill feeling. A few months later, Angustias did send clothes to her daughter, as well as some expensive wedding gifts, such as a satin bedspread embroidered with silk and lace, -colored, lace covered linen sheets. Sully wrote that the best bedspread must have cost $200. And he said, they can't be that mad. So I guess they weren't. Manuela's parents agreed to a reconciliation when they learned that Manuela was expecting a baby. They wanted Sully to resign from the army and settle down. And to facilitate this, they were willing to give him part of their ranch. And here we have the watercolor that Sully did of that ranch. Here we have uh, another drawing, another rendering of the same ranch. Manuela's father persuaded Sully to take a two mile square section of the ranch and develop it. On March 27th, 1851, less than two weeks, I'm sorry, uh, before that, Sully did decide to build a sawmill on the land and a flour mill, I forgot to mention that. Um, on the day that he found the spot where he wanted to build the flour mill, uh, someone came from town, a messenger came and told him Manuela had just given birth to a little boy and she was attended to by her mother and two older women since there was no physician in town. They named the baby Thomas Manuel Sully after his grand grandfathers. So now with this baby as part of his family, Sully began to contemplate his future as a rancher in California. And he was truly happy for the first time since he had left home. Now on March 27th, 1851, less than two weeks after giving birth, Manuela became violently ill after eating an orange that was given to her by a former suitor. It was rumored that the suitor had put poison in the fruit. Manuela suffered terribly and she died a violent death the next day. The orange and the suitor were blamed, but it was possible that she had contracted cholera. The final blow for Sully came on April 14th. Angustias had recently given birth to a child and she was taking care of not only her own child, but Manuela's infant. On that night, when she took little Thomas to bed with her to nurse him, she fell asleep with the baby in her arms. When she woke up, she found that the baby had died. Angustias had accidentally strangled the little boy in her sleep. Dr. Ord, who would become her future husband, he, he said that the baby had died of a convulsion. That's what he told Angustias. But he told Sully, and only Sully the truth, that Angustias had accidentally strangled the child. Sully did not attend the funeral. He said, I have been robbed of a treasure that can never be replaced. I shall leave this place as soon as I can. I will give up my rancho and mill, for I, I have no intention now of leaving the army. Before I leave, I shall erect a tomb to mark the grave of my wife and child. The slab with this inscription I expect soon from San Francisco. And this is the inscription that he placed on the tombstone. I have uh, transcribed the Spanish for you on the right. And then on the left, you have the English translation. To Doña Manuela Jimeno, her husband, Don Alfred Sully, Lieutenant of the US Army, dedicates this headstone as a lasting tribute and final remembrance of his love and affection. She died March 28, 1851, at the age of 17 years and five months. To her son, Don Thomas Manuel Sully, who died the 15th of April, 1851, at the age of one month. This story deeply touched my heart. I felt so sad for Sully. And I wanted to find this gravestone this uh, somewhere in Monterey. Well, a year or so ago, Bob and I went down to Pacific Grove uh, to celebrate our anniversary. It was actually, it was on July 10th. And being the research nerds that we are, we thought we'd spend some time at, 
uh, doing a little research down there and I convinced my dear husband to uh, indulge me and let me go grave hunting. So we did and we found the grave thanks to the help of this wonderful groundskeeper and another assistant at, at this cemetery. The grave had been covered over with a lot of grass and the groundske groundskeeper cleaned it up for us. And here you see the inscription that Sully had put on the tombstone. Now this, this tombstone had been standing up, upright, and eventually fell and, and cracked, but it, it's still there if, if you ever want to visit the cemetery and pay your respects to this couple. Here we have a portrait of Sully in his uniform. He left California in 1854, a broken man, forever marked by the tragedy of losing his beloved Manuela and their son. He began frontier service on the Northern Plains, building or repairing forts in the Dakotas, Minnesota, and Nebraska. The proximity of Indian encampments to the forts inspired his paintings of Sioux Indians, including this particular representation of what he titled Sioux Indian Maidens. While serving at Fort Pierre in what is now South Dakota, Sully fathered a daughter who was born in 1858, and he fathered a daughter by a Sioux woman. We believe that one of the women in this painting is the mother of his daughter who was named Mary Sully. She was also known as Akisitawin, which means soldier woman. Now, soldier woman's daughter, Alfred's granddaughter, took on the name Mary Sully when she was an adult and she became an artist. So you can trace the artistic heritage from Thomas Sully to Alfred Sully to his granddaughter, Mary Sully. And there is a book out, it's called Becoming Mary Sully and it talks all about her, her artwork. Uh, this artist was born in 1896 and she died August 29th, 1863. So I encourage you to, to look at that book, it's, it's fascinating. Now, Sully rose to the rank of Brigadier General during the first half of the Civil War. After the war ended, he was assigned to Fort Vancouver and he spent his time in campaigns against the Indians there and in Idaho. By 1873, he had begun to develop rheumatism and arthritis and he was no longer able to go out in the field. He was made post commander at Fort Vancouver and it was there that he began painting again. Sadly, in 1879, pneumonia took the life of the old soldier. Here we have our three artists, Myers, Hunt, and Sully. All three of them came to military units to fulfill the responsibilities that had been assigned to them. But thankfully, they did more than their job. They were taken in by the California landscape, by the California people, and they wrote about this and they depicted what they saw in their watercolors and pencil drawings. We are so grateful that they chose to remember their experiences in California that way, because we now have a collection of fascinating art artwork and we've only shown you parts of it. There's so much more uh, to be shared, which we hope to do in a future publication. And we can share that with you in a couple of years, I hope. I hope that our introduction to these three gentlemen has been enjoyable, that you've learned something about their lives, and that the next time you see some of their artwork, you will think of them in a different way, not just, oh, I know that painting, I've seen it before, but you will remember what inspired these various paintings. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all very much, and uh, we'll turn this back over to, uh, to Paul, and um, if there are any uh, questions or um, or comments, we'd be more than happy to uh, try to respond to them. I have a comment. It's Lucia. Lucia. I, I read a biography of Sherman, who's, who actually was a friend of my great grandmother's. Oh, and wow. and in, I, when I was reading your testimonials, 
I know that he was, his landlady was, was uh, Augustia de la Guerra. And, yeah, Augustia's right. Yeah, and she, uh, she commented about how wonderful the American soldiers were at dances. And that, but there was one that had red hair that clashed with his uniform. And so I figured that must have been uh, Sherman. So I, I feel like this collection of paintings and drawings has just made all of this very visual and I enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank you. Well, thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Lucia. Uh, you know, one of the things that's kind of, um, kind of interesting in this whole thing is that um, the, these people, um, the, 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 the first generation of American uh, military personnel in California were by and large uh, much more, uh, they, they tried, you know, I mean, given their, their position, they, they tried obviously imperfectly, but they tried to understand the local California culture. They tried to, you know, they're, they're seeing things that these guys had never seen before. The Sierra Nevada, you know, which we saw in Hutton's painting, you know, the Pacific Ocean. You know, they'd never seen a bay as big as San Francisco Bay. They'd never seen a Mexican. You know, they'd never seen a lot of things. And, they, and they're trying to understand, um, you know, sympathetically um, what, this, what this culture kind of, of is. They're, they're very different, this first generation. They're very different than the, uh, than the gold seekers who come in uh, starting in 49 and 50. You know, these people who come in 46, 47, 48, they're, 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 they're trying to be more understanding of the culture in which they find themselves than a lot of the, um, a lot of the people who come in later. And that's, I think, what makes, them, what makes their art so, so very, very important and why Rosemary and I want to try to do something with it. Um, does anyone else have a question that they would like to uh, yeah, throw yes. to the I, I have a question. Uh, this is Gary. Uh, Samantha, uh, uh, my video icon says that you're keeping me. Uh, <laughs> you can start your video. So Pardon? if you go to the little camera at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. But it says uh, it won't work because uh, it says because the host has stopping it. No, it works. <laughs> Sorry, but I, I have a question I can ask. Uh, and I'm still clicking on it. It still doesn't, it isn't unmuted yet, apparently. What's You're your question? Uh, it's the video one. It's, it's next to the uh, The question is, uh, do you have? There you go. Oh, there we go. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Um, are there any uh, ways to get uh, copies of these uh, uh, pictures that you have you have shown us? Uh, is, uh, can they be put on uh, online somewhere so that we can print them? Or are there any commercial copies of these? Because some of them well, are just wonderful. Well, with the Myers drawings, you they have been digitized, and if you contact the Roosevelt Library in Hyde Park you can get them online. Uh, they, they'll share them that way. The Hutton images are at the Huntington Library. And again, those are online. And the Sully images, we actually found uh, quite a few of those uh, when we were doing research at Yale. And some of Sully's, the Rancho scene, for example, that's available from the Oakland Museum. Uh, so you can get that one, but his are not all located in one place. We found many of them in uh, collections at, at Yale. But uh, if there's a particular, uh, if there are some particular images that you like, I would be happy to share them with you. Uh, if you're going to publish them, uh, you'll have to get, as you know, the permission from, from the library. It's a different repositories, but I'd be very happy to, to help you with that. Okay, well, that would just that would just be wonderful. Super. And, uh, I think we should encourage the Presidio Trust to uh, consider posting these, some of these around uh, in in one of the rooms in, in the in the main building there. 
and uh, give yeah, credit we, to you. Yeah, and we hope, you know, our, our present project, as, uh, as we were telling um, uh, Samantha and, and Paul before, is, is on Mariana Guadalupe Vallejo, who actually had, you know, was, was actually stationed at the San Francisco Presidio. And we, we're, what we're doing right now is we are finishing off uh, translating for the, for the first time in English for publication, uh, his five volume uh, history of California that he did for, uh, for Hubert Howe Bancroft. Uh, and when we, when we get that out, which we're hoping would be within a year, then our next project is actually this military artist thing. We'd really like to do a, you know, a, a publication uh, with that. And, and uh, the University of Oklahoma Press, which is a very fine, uh, publisher of Western Americana is, is expressed could you, an interest in, in, could you repeat again who you're speaking of? Who, who is it that is, uh, has this? Vallejo. Oh. We were talking about uh, our translation project that we've, we've basically finished. Uh, we've translated the five volumes that Vallejo wrote on the history of California. Yeah. So, so that's going to be published by the University of Oklahoma Press. We're almost ready to send the manuscript to them. Our target date is the end of this month, actually. So keep your fingers crossed. But um, we were, Bob was talking about uh, the military artist book that we, this presentation is based on, on some of our research and we plan on, on producing a book about these artists uh, in the next couple of years. We're working on that simultaneously with the Vallejo project. So as I said, we're kind of research nerds. We do enjoy this a lot. Uh, okay. These people are so real to us. Uh, I just, I just love them. So. Well, thank you very much. I mean, this is just, uh, I think, just a wonderful presentation. And it's not only have its, has its merits in the art world, but uh, in in the history. I mean, what a great way to uh, bring history to to everyone uh, through these sketches. It's just terrific. Thank you, Gary. Thank, thank you. Very you. Much. So does that mean you approve of us making a book, publishing a book on the artists? Do we get the thumbs up from you? Yay. From yeah, all of us, we can't wait. Just let us know when it's available. Yeah. Excellent. I do kind of like your idea, Gary, of, of putting up some of the images if, as an exhibit or uh, uh, to decorate some of the walls. Uh, yes. If you would need help with any kind of captioning, uh, please feel free to reach out to us because I think we're the only people who are dealing with this right now. Uh, so we, we're always happy to assist. The Presidio Trust, we need to get over that hurdle first. And <laughs> then, right. then we'll, we'll do this. But I think it's something we should try. Yeah. Super. I think the Presidio- You know where to find us. <laughs> Presidio Historical Association should make that known to the Presidio Trust. Thank you. We'll do it. Yeah, good. <laughs> well, we hope that we can come back and talk to you about Vallejo. Every time I say Vallejo to people, you all know who that is, but if you speak to people in general, they go, who, Vallejo? And I say like, you know, Vallejo, California? And then they, <laughs> then they get it, who we're talking about. But, oh my God, we have worked on this project for a, a long time. It's you know, it's 2000 pages of transcription that I've translated. It's a big book. It's gonna be uh, two volumes of translation, plus a third volume of essays that we're writing that deal with the themes that appear in the manuscript. And um, there's a, we have a th uh, an essay about culture. And then there's also going to be an essay about the relationship between Francisca Benicia and Mariano Guadalupe. They wrote letters back and forth and uh, they're extremely interesting. And there's gonna be an essay on that. And that essay is also going to be turned into a book about the relationship between the two of them. And I, I tell people that sometimes when I'm reading these letters, I feel like I need Dr. Phil or somebody there because I'm kind of getting into this personal stuff and I feel like a voyeur. Um, <laughs> it's weird. But I will tell you one funny story that should hopefully whet your appetite for, for the book. Um, Vallejo, his financial situation... Uh, went up and down and he did lose a lot of, of money. They were basically quite poor. Uh, 
And at one point, Benicia came up with this idea and she said, I think if we rent our bathrooms here at Lacrima Montes, then we can actually make some money and I can help you with that. Oh my God, he was so ticked off by that. He <laughs> wrote her this letter. It's like, no way, you're not going to be renting our bathrooms to people. You know, the, it's a question of honor, blah, 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 blah. And <laughs> every time I, I read that, I tell a story, I crack up because, you know, renting bathrooms, but it's funny, but it isn't funny. Here she's trying to help. She's trying to do something to help her husband. He takes offense because his honor is is then questioned. You're renting bathrooms. And it says a lot about the dynamics of the marriage, her role as a woman during that time, how she's negotiating her space, uh, physical space and the marriage space. It's a fascinating relationship. It truly is. And I'm so excited to be able to talk to people about the two of them, to get that book out there and, uh, and just to, to share all the things that we've learned about these folks uh, with people like you who care about them, who are interested. Uh, it's, it's been a, a project that's just been a dream. Uh, it's been hard, but I still love all these people. That's my cast of characters. And, and I always tell everybody that poor Bob, he has to put up with me and all of my various boyfriends that I have, <laughs> uh, 19th century boyfriends, you know, they're, they're all deceased, but I do care deeply about them. And uh, just the, the usual cast of characters. Uh, I love these folks. I, I really do. And I feel really honored that we can be the stewards and present their voices to you in English. Well, I have a, a comment there too. Um, I used to be stationed at Benicia Arsenal uh -huh. uh, when I was in the military. And I do know a number of people in that town uh, who are interested in history. And so if you'd like to uh, set up some sort of a uh, display or a chance to make a presentation on your book, uh, do, uh, do get in touch with me uh, through the- Thank PSA. you. And uh, I'll put you in touch with the people who might be able to arrange it. I don't know if they can arrange a display within Benicia Arsenal itself, the old building. They might, uh, but uh, certainly they'd be able to put it but in. But a there. talk, yeah, yeah. right. Uh, great. Right. Yeah. Pardon? A talk would certainly be great too, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we want to sign you up for one, maybe for the fall. Um, you can pick the topic. It sounds like Benicia. Benicia and uh, Mariano would be a good one. Oh, I think so. <laughs> oh. I'm not going to tell you anything else. I, you're going to have that's like a little carrot. The bathroom is the carrot. There's <laughs> there are other things to, to talk about, and also the the topic of education that runs like a thread throughout his entire manuscript. And he talks about what it was like to be a student in school in Monterey. And uh, it's almost Dickensian. It's almost like a, a page out of a Dickens novel, the way he describes it. Uh, I, I think you would all enjoy that very much. Uh, we have, we have enjoyed it. There's so much, the manuscript is so valuable and we feel that people are going to be happy to, to have copies of it. It's gonna be heavy, two volumes. It'll probably weigh a lot, but it's worth it. <laughs> it's definitely worth it. Hi, I, um, I, I, I didn't know that he had written a history. This is new to me, news to me. Um, Good. So the five volumes, what, what, can you tell me a little bit, of, is it like a memoir more than a history? Is it most likely history? Is it, what time period does it? Does I'll let Bob answer because I've been hogging this one. <laughs> well, he basically did this for, um, at the request of Bancroft, of Hubert Howe Bancroft. Uh, Bancroft, when he started to write, his history of California was interested in trying to get documents uh, from, you know, old from Californios who who had them, you know, in their family possession, uh, and so Bancroft approached Vallejo, Vallejo, and asked him um, for documents, and Vallejo said um, that he would be happy to do that, but he also would like to give some personal reminiscences. So he dictated what eventually turned out to be five volumes. And he actually went over the, 
the, the copies and made corrections as he went along, uh, to one of Bancroft's assistants, a man named Enrique Cerruti. Um, and by the time, you know, Vallejo introduced Bancroft to this kind of oral history. And by the time it was all over, Bancroft's staff had taken these kind of oral histories or these testimonials from uh, over 85 people who lived in Mexican California. Uh, and Vallejo's was the longest. It was five volumes and it was so long that it's never, it's never been unfortunately translated from from Spanish into English. And that's what Rosemary and I are, uh, are doing. It basically deals with the, with the um, pre-US period. That was what Bancroft was interested in. So in Vallejo's case, he does talk about the Bear Flag uh, Rebellion right at, the, at towards the end because he was arrested and held as a prisoner in Sutter's Fort for a couple of months by the Bear Flaggers, but that's probably you know he's but he, he spends most of his time he's talking about about uh, Mexican California in the 1830s and 1840s when he was military commander of of, uh, of all of California for a while and then military commander of the North and then a ranchero at especially Petaluma but other places like Sassoon and Solano counties. And so he, it, it's, it's a very, very complete history picture. You know, it's a, it's a mix of memoir and history uh, mm -hmm. that gives a kind of a unique perspective on, uh, on California. And what Rosemary was talking about with his insistence on, on education is, is really important because, and we make this point in the testimonial book because a lot of the women who Bancroft's staff interviewed had the same feeling. You know, by the 1870s, most Anglos living in California thought that Mexican culture was, was nothing, was kind of worthless. You know, California's real history begins with the discovery of gold and the American takeover. Thank you very much. You know, and what Vallejo and the and the and these Californios are in, insisting is that no, you know, we had a culture. We had um, a civilization. We had a, a, a developed society, which you guys could learn from uh, as you were developing and, and building your own society. So, you know, like all histories, it's about the past, but it's also about the present. And that's, that's one of the things that makes it really interesting. Does he, uh, does he have a perspective or insights or story of relationship with the indigenous peoples? Oh yes, yes, and and, and uh, Vallejo was, you know, that's that's one of the things that he he really struggles with because he was a, as a military officer in Mexican California. He went out and fought the indigenous peoples. He he fought a Stanislaus, for example, after whom Stanislaus County is named, um, and he's, he he engaged in a number of other um, uh, activities, uh, military activities against the indigenous people. Uh, when the ranchos got started, you know, as, as Rosemary uh, indicated, you know, when you're looking at the, at the pictures, uh, most of the laborers are Indians. And, you know, we don't know as much about that as we do about the missions because, you know, the rancheros didn't keep the records that the missionaries kept, you know, but most of the laborers in the, ranchero, in the ranchos and in Vallejo's case, Petaluma, but also, you know, the ranchos in the Monterey area, the Jimeno Rancho, uh, the ranchos in the Santa Barbara area, the Ortega and De La Guerra ranchos. Uh, they were all, the, the Indians were, uh, were the laborers and we just don't know as much as we would like to about the way in which they were, quote, recruited. Uh, a lot of them were captured in raiding parties into the Central Valley, things like that. And, you know, we just don't know as much about them, but it does deal with that. Uh, also in his testimony. There's, there's uh, some Bixby who wrote a book called Adobe Days or something. Yeah. And she goes in, into you know how they ran their rancho. I guess they must have taken it over from one of the Californios. I don't know which one it was. Yeah, it probably was. And, and, and you know, during the, uh, I mean, by the time the Americans come in and take over the, the the ranchos, you know, a lot of them are broken up into smaller into smaller places, and you know, the 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 California ranchos were basically they didn't raise food so much as they raised cattle, you know. So 
Some of them were, were trained to be vaqueros and, and, and things like that. But we just don't know, you know, as much as we would like to know about how they were treated, how they were recruited, you know, when, when, uh, when, uh, when an indigenous person in the missions would be born, the missionaries would keep records. When they got married, the same thing. When they died, the same thing, you know, when they were godparents. So you can kind of reconstruct a lot of indigenous life through the mission records, but the rancheros didn't keep those kind of records. So it's much more difficult to reconstruct what the, um, what the experience was, but we can, be, you know, it certainly was, um, there was, there was certainly an element of coercion in some of the experiences that the indigenous peoples had on the ranchos. I had a question. Okay, hi. Um, yeah, I read some letters by um, Vallejo's wife, and I believe she was really shocked at, with the Americans at how harsh they were with justice, like with certain criminals, just would get hanged and they were just sort of really shocked by Americans. But anyway, I was wondering the picture of Portsmouth Square in San Francisco. Do you know if any of the buildings are still there? I suspect not, but I'm not sure. But I mean, um, the last time I've been at Portsmouth Square has been a number of years ago. But I mean, my, my gut sense would be, I mean, Portsmouth Square is in Chinatown and that was severely damaged by the earthquake. Wow. So I, I would imagine that there's nothing there that, that's... Um, that's uh, that dates back to the gold rush year. They're just a, actually are just a few off of um, off Columbus Avenue in, in an area called Jackson Square right. in San Francisco. There's some there's some buildings that do go back to the uh, to the to the gold rush era, but that I think is really the only part of the city that I'm aware of that you get buildings that go go back that far. Sherman's Bank was one of those buildings, interestingly enough, I think he, he was the manager of a, of a firm called Lucas Turner and Company. And um, uh, I think that his, his bank is one of those buildings that, you know, at least a part of one of the, the structures in Jackson Square can be traced back to that. Yeah, I think there's a lot. I, well, I wanted to comment, Phil, that there is a book about uh, early California, Spanish and Mexican law I borrowed it from Boyd Delarios. And there, there were so few people in California. I don't think they ever did the death penalty. They just didn't want to lose anybody. And they had various, one, one poor guy was given the choice after he was convicted of manslaughter. And this may be in your testimonials too. Um, yeah. There, there was. I, well, you must go to the Presidio and build adobes. And the guy said, I'd rather die. And so he went down to LA and died in a fight, you know, a, a rebellion. There was, there was at least one uh, death uh, penalty case because Vallejo was involved in that. It was very upset that the governor used the death penalty against the soldier Francisco Rubio whom, um, whom Vallejo was, uh, was defending. I think that was about, the governor was Manuel Victoria. So I think it was 1830, 1831. Great, we have a question also from Bill. Um, he's interested to know more about the 1820s to 1840s relationship between the Californios uh, who descended from the Spanish and the post-revolution Mexican colonial government that came into Alta California and the after the Spanish were overthrown. Can you guys touch on that at all? There, there, there were some in, in, in testimonials, for example, we have one um, uh, description from Juana Machado. I think it's Juana Machado, wasn't it, Rosemary, mm -hmm. about the changing of the flags where, yeah. where you know, when the, when the Spanish flag was taken down and the Mexican flag was raised, uh, there was a tremendous um, mourning period among some of the soldiers in the, in the, in the Presidio. And what happens is that, um, you know, after, after Mexican, uh, Mexico attained its independence in 1821, the first governor that was appointed was Luis Antonio Arguello, who was a, a native of California. Um, but then all of the other governors came in from Mexico. They were appointed, you know, Me Alta California was a territory of the Mexican Republic. And, just like in the US territorial system, the, the governor was appointed 
and then there was an elected legislature, a deputacion. Most, a good number of the governors that Mexico sent, they did not like, and they kicked them out. Governor Victoria that I just mentioned, Governor Mariano Chico, his successor, Governor Gutierrez, and then Governor Manuel Michel Torena. So I don't remember offhand how, what the total number of governors were, but I suspect that more than 50% of them were kicked out. So there was, there was a lot of tension, you know, and, and in the testimonial, Vallejo will, will blame the Mexican, you know, the, the, the Californios sort of saw themselves as what they called orphan children of Mexico, that Mexico really didn't care that much about them. Well, in fact, uh, Antonio Maria Ocio, in, in his uh, writings, he said that California was like the bastard child of Mexico. That's the way he phrased it, even harsher than an orphan child. He was the bastards. So they were always upset about not, uh, the soldiers were upset about not getting paid. They would go for you know, a year at a time without receiving any of their salary. It was hard. As you all know, you, you study this area. You're, this, is, this is not new information to you. But when you read about it, uh, for example, in Vallejo's Testimonio, it just, he brings it to life and you feel it. You really do. The way the people suffered and how hard they worked and that this was not a, a romanticized kind of life. This was a hard, hard life for these folks. My admiration for all of them just increases every time I work on this project. And I'm not trying to you know, be hyperbolic about it. Really, they, they were, they're heroes to me in how they survived and how they they really wanted to develop California. It meant a lot to them to develop this area. Then, and then when the Americans came in, that's another thing I, I was thinking about. I, I was born here in California in San Jose Hospital, went to school here my whole life. And I remember in fourth grade how the bear flaggers, wow, they're these heroes. They come in and they take over Sonoma and everything was so positive the way, we, that's the way we were taught. And uh, after doing all this research for so many years and reading uh, the descriptions of the bear flaggers, the way the people were treated, the way the women were treated, for example, in, in Sonoma, right, Lucia, you're right, the fingers down. I'm like, whoa, we definitely need a more balanced curriculum uh, in school. And I think, I think people are making strides in that, in that way. But still, I, I think that's not what I remember about Fremont and all the other folks. Uh, it's, it's nice to, to see both sides and to formulate my own opinion of the situation with both sides of the story. But boy, Benicia, I said I wasn't going to say anything more about her, but I will. Um, she, tough cookie. Oh, my God, that woman. I just love her. She... Uh, like they say in Spanish, no tenía pelos en la lengua, you know, no hair on her tongue. She says it like it is, baby. And, uh, and she's, she kept, I think it was four uh, pistols in her uh, bureau drawer in her room to fight off any of the bear flaggers, any of the Anglos. She was going to protect her family. So she was, she was a tough mama. She was. And uh, there's another letter in which she says, you know, I, I, I want to express myself the way the American women do, but my family won't let me. And uh, so she, when the American women come in, she sees that they're a little more vocal in expressing their opinions, but yet she's still bound by a stereotypical uh, roles, patriarchal society, uh, Hispanic society. And her family says, no, mama, you can't say these things that you want to write in this letter. You can't do it. But she says, if I were an American woman, I could. So feisty, lover. Incredible. I have a question. Just what inspired you to begin on uh, studying the painters of the Mexican War? <laughs> and was there like one story that you just like decided to look into and then it opened everything up or... You know? Well, actually, uh, Bob and I had received fellowships to study, uh, do research at the Huntington Library back in 2016, and, and it was for the Vallejo project. We wanted to go down and, and uh, read through the, the documents and other literature there, 
And I knew that the Hutton images were housed there. They are housed there. And I just wanted to hold them in my hand, you know, see them, see the real thing, not just something in a book or on, on a computer screen. And so we, we asked to see them. And then we realized that there were more images there than we had ever seen before. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Huntington had published uh, back in the 40s, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the Hutton pictures and the Hutton diaries from California. So we just assumed that that was everything. But we dis discovered when we saw the originals that there was a lot of diary stuff that yeah. had not been included. And about half the pictures had not been included. Yeah. So we went, to, we went to the director of research at the Huntington. We asked for an appointment, got it. And we said, hey, listen, you've got a whole bunch of other things in here that have never been published. And he didn't realize that either. And so he was very excited about the project and we figured, hey, listen. So we started with Hutton, but then as a lot of it projects grew. do, <laughs> it, ex it expanded. Yeah. Well, and also Hutton, I, I quoted from some letters and, and diary entries, and he had some stuff in Spanish that nobody has published. Nobody's translated it. It was fascinating. And I thought, okay, this can be another book. And I remember that that appointment we had with Steve Hindle, Hindle, right? I think it is. Right. And, uh, and we said, oh my God, you've got a treasure trove here. So many things in, these di in this diary and in these letters that people have never seen. And we'd like to, to get it out there for you. He was super interested. So, uh, so we've been, it, what's fascinating about the work we do is, well, the first thing is being married to your best friend and research partner is fantastic. So we're always sharing stuff at, at home, but we've seen how all these different projects, they kind of weave together. Uh, it's, it's really neat. Uh, in the images that we've shown you, we're gonna use some of those images in the Vallejo book. Uh, everybody seems to know one another, they encounter one another. You know, Sully and Angustias and that whole story, uh, everything ties together. Our research, we've been really blessed when we go to do research at a repository, we'll find some things like, oh, wow, that would be cool for this project or that project, or we'll develop a new one. And I think you can kind of tell we like what we do. <laughs> so, uh, and we like to share it with people. That's the best part. We like to share our information. As I said to Gary earlier, I'm happy to, to share any of the images that we've shown you today uh, with, with all of you. It, it, we don't hoard any of our stuff like a lot of people do. We like it to get out there so that people can learn. It's thrilling, it really is. Absolutely. Are there any other questions that um, people have for? A uh, quick Wonder question, Ex actually, for, for you is: Is this going to be uh, available to other people? I mean, are we? Yes, gonna we're going to be putting it on. Yes, we're going to be putting on the PHA YouTube site. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah that's great. I just have one more, one more question the about the about uh, Vallejo. Um, is it? Thank you. How, how how did you know about this history? Where, well, where we, is it? How did you know about it? It's at the Bancroft Library, mm -hmm. and we knew about it when we first started working on the Antonio Maria Osio manuscript. Uh, that was back in 1990. Yikes, long time ago. And so we, we saw his testimonio, and we saw the testimonials of the women, which that was my idea. Let's turn that into a book, which we did. And then <laughs> Uh, this poor man, honest to God, he has to live with me. Uh, but also there are the other testimonials from the men. There are others that we um, also used. And also I, I thought it would be really fun to, to work on the Vallejo testimonial since nobody else really had tackled it. And once you start working on it, you can see why they haven't tackled it because it's, it's complicated, it's long. Uh, and you, you really need to have experience to work on it. So um, I, Bob and I talked to uh, Elaine Tennant, the director of the Bancroft Library, and she was ecstatic that we wanted to work on it because nobody, everyone's afraid because it's so big. And um, so she said yes, and they consider the Vallejo manuscript to be the jewel in the collection of the Bancroft Library. 
that those are their words. Yes. And so we're getting that baby yeah. out there for them. We, we are. I, I just am so happy, so happy. It's, it's been a labor of love. And, uh, and the neat thing about it is I still love the project. I'm not tired of it. I'm afraid I'm going to have like some sort of withdrawal after it's, <laughs> after it's all done. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thank you. Where can people um, purchase your books or find them? Well, you can purchase, the, go ahead, Bob, I'm monopolizing, sorry. Well, they're, uh, they're, the University of Oklahoma Press has, uh, has three of them. They have, they have Lands of Promise and Despair, Testimonials, and our Sarah book. Um, the University of Wisconsin has our OCO book, and they're all available through either the university uh, website, the University Press website, or Amazon has them all too. Yeah. Okay, great. Because I think some of our guests today might be interested in getting their hands on those to read through them. So I want to make sure that they got that information. Thank you, Samantha. Absolutely. And we'll also provide a link to um, whichever place is best to get it. Of course, we don't, yeah. we want to make sure that our authors and our publishers are well supported. And so we'll put that with the YouTube as well. Great. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Any we also have, oh, I'm sorry. I was oh, no, gonna no, say, no. We also have a guide to the manuscripts dealing with Baja California that we put together for the Bancroft Library. And we have those. Uh, it, the guide was published in Mexico. The Bancroft Library paid for it. It was the project they wanted done. So if any of you are interested in that book, we'd be happy to send it to you. Uh, it's a really good research tool. Uh, it's about yay thick. Um, and it, it's really, really good. Uh, Walter Bram, who no longer, he's retired from the Bancroft, he asked us to do that project. So we did. So if you have relatives, descendants, uh, or ancestors uh, from Baja California, or you know of somebody who was doing research on Baja California, we'd be happy to, to share that book with them. And we'll also provide, if it's okay with you guys, we'll provide an email contact for you to our guest today. That'd be uh, perfect. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it was wonderful. Yeah. And, and as Rosemary has said, and uh, I'd like to second it, we hope that the next time we do this, we can do it uh, at the golf club again or wherever, wherever, um, wherever the, the, the historical society is meeting. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's just a splendid presentation. Samantha, will you sign us out? Absolutely. So thank you everyone for joining us uh, today. And we hope that you enjoyed uh, this year's annual meeting. I will say that it was a unanimous vote for all three of our um, nominees for board uh, renewals. So Mike Brassington is uh, reelected to the board and Paul Wormer is reelected to the board and I am elected to the board. So <laughs> thank you all for your votes. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to our future programs, whether it's virtual or fingers crossed uh, in person for <laughs> tours right. in the near future. So yeah, if anyone um, has any last thoughts, uh, feel free to unmute yourselves and, uh, you know, we're, we still have a little more time on the Zoom and of course, um, yeah, final thoughts or anything like that. And if not, I will be happy to close us out. I just saw Phil's comment. Thank you, Phil. I'm glad you like testimonials yeah. that appeared on my screen. It really makes history come alive. I recommend Thank it. you. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks for inviting both. us. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank All you. right. Well, everyone Thank have a lovely uh, rest of your day. And thanks for joining us for PHA's annual meeting. And we hope to see you soon. You bet. Thank you. Thank thanks. you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.